Good day learners! Welcome back to my channel. In this video, another lesson that we will be dealing with Philippine history and government. Today's topic is divided into two. The first one is the first Filipinos, ancestors, cultures, and way of life. And the second one is the arrival and spread of Islam. These are the subtopics that we are going to tackle. Number one, we have the political order of our ancestors. Number two, their customs. Three, our Filipino cultures. And of course, number four, the arrival and spread of Islam. The cultural life of our Filipino ancestors. Now class, according to researcher, present-day Taiwan is the ancestral homeland of the Austronesian-speaking peoples, which include Filipinos, Indonesian, Malaysian, Pacific Islanders, and the people of Madagascar. The first group of Malays who landed here in the Philippines had already their own culture, and they led quiet and orderly lives and had their own system of knowledge. These natives built small communities by the rivers, seashores, and inland waters and were easily to adapt their life to the new environment. But how about their political order? In terms of political order, they already had barangay. A barangay is a term of Malay origin which means bangka or boat. Historically, balangay boats were once used by the native migrants who sailed from their homeland and rich Philippine soil. It was composed of 25 to 100 families and the head or chief was called Datu or Raha. Nowadays, it is being called as a president, yeah, the leader. And those head or chief, or let's say Datu or Raha, they are the one who wielded vast powers over his constituents. What are the roles as a Datu or Raha? Now, basically, the Datu or Raha enforced the law. They are also the administrator of land. They are also the chief warrior in times of war with the neighboring barangays, and they also stood as a judge. Aside from Datu or Raha, we also have tribal chief way back then. He stood as a defender of a weak and innocent. It's like a lawyer way back then, but uh, during our ancestors' time, it was being called tribal chief. He also solicited the advice of the council of elders. In the beginning, the position of Datu or Raha was inherited by the eldest son or daughter. Then eventually, it went to anyone with the following qualities. Number one, the Datu or Raha should have wealth, not only wealth but also intelligence. And most importantly is that the love for the country or kabayanihan. So those were the qualities being um, looked for way back then for you to have the possession of being a Datu or Raha. What about our laws or what about the laws of our ancestors? Now our ancient laws were products of our customs that had been handed down from generation to generation. And there were also written laws like the Code of Kalantiao and Maragtas. The Code of Kalantiao, or the Code of Raha Kalantiao, was a supposed legal code in the epic history Maragtas that is said to have been written in 1433 by Datu Kalantiao, a chief on the island of Negros in the Philippines. On the other hand, the Maragtas Code was a supposed collection of writings concerning the pre-Hispanic history of the Philippines. Social order. The family is the smallest unit of our society, and each member had an important role to play. The father stood as the head of the family, the mother took care of the household, and the son accompanied his father in hunting or farming, and the daughter stayed home to learn the household chores. Society is divided into three classes. We have Maharlika. Timawa or freemen, and alipin or slaves. 
Maharlika refers to those persons or to those families who are having a good life, a wealth, wealthier life. It is being called as the upper class. While Timawa or Freemen were a feudal warriors class of the ancient Visayan society. They were regarded as higher than Uripon but below Maharlika or Tumau in Visayan society. And lastly, the Alipin or slaves are helpers of Maharlika and some Timawa. Alipin is divided into two categories. We have Aliping Namamahay and Aliping Sagigilid. Now, what is the difference between the two? Between the two um, slaves or Alipin? Aliping Namamahay, these are the servants to Adatu and Timawas and had the right to own property. While Aliping Sagigilid enjoyed no rights and freedom. There were they were no rights and freedom at the same time. They were considered properties of their master. Religion. Our early ancestors had their own beliefs regarding home, the world in general, and, and life after death. They were already have that idea about the things that we've mentioned a while ago. Different gods like Bathala, Anito or spirits of departed ancestors, and priests or Babaylan in Visayas. Now, these are the different gods way back then. Now, when we say Bathala, it is about, it refers to the ruler of heaven and earth. When we say Anito or spirits of departed ancestors, it is considered as their redeemers and mediators. And priests or babaylan in Visayas were presided over rituals and ceremonies. Of course, our ancestors had the modes of dressing way back then. Now, the early Filipinos had their own style in dressing. They also used ornaments to enhance their physical appearance. Clothes are made of cotton, silk, and plant fibers. We called kangan. Now, when we say kangan, it it's like a colorless and short-sleeved jacket worth, worn by the men. As you can see in the picture, it is a colorless and at the same time short-sleeved jacket. Yeah, a beautiful dress worn by men. Of course, the very iconic, we have bahag. It is a cloth wrapped around the waist and between legs. So please refer to the picture there. As you can see, the cloth is wrapped around the waist and between the legs. So that is what we call bahag. Another thing, we do also have putong. When we say putong, it is a piece of cloth around the head. Yeah, just like what you can see. In the picture given, that is what we called putong, a piece of cloth that our ancestors put around their heads. In addition, both men and women often wear bracelet, rings, and necklaces. So definitely those ornaments that will like made them presentable at the same time, very luxurious like that. Next one, a tattoo was another popular body ornament. Not only the, what they call it, not only the jewelries, but also tattoo was considered as their body ornament way back then. Wherein the tattoo symbolizes beauty or bravery. Even women way back then, they put tattoos. Now let's have the customs. In customs, it includes the courtship, marriage, and burial. So these are the ceremonies that are very important way back then. Courtship and marriage. Marriage was an aspect of life regarded seriously by our ancestors. The choice of partner was based on the best wishes of the parents. And a man must give a dowry 
to the girl's family before he may ask for her hand in marriage. He must also serve in the house of the girl he wishes to marry. So those are the conditions or those were the conditions being proposed whenever there is a person who is was was eyeing for marriage or courtship. Next, we have the burial. The dead often underwent careful preparation. They were buried in river banks or seashores and sometimes in caves. And when a Datu died, mourning rites called the Larao were accorded to him by the people. So up until now, we do also have that kind of ceremony burial. Uh, nowadays, it is being called as pagbibigay ng lamay or araw wherein magkakaroon ng lamay. Of course, we have our Filipino culture. Our country is very rich in terms of its culture in relation with arts and music, writings, literature, livelihood, and other aspects. We are very rich in terms of our culture. In arts and music, our Filipino ancestors were music lovers. No, up until now, we are music lovers. And this can be seen in their instruments such as kudyapi, kubing, pasing, lantoy, buktot, kalaking, gansa, tultogan, and others. Aside from the musical instruments, they also had songs for various occasions, just like ayegka of Igorots and the Tingyans in Abra. Uh, songs for planting like the Anoay of the Igorots and Palasintahan sa Taniman of the Tagalogs. And other songs for sailing, healing, marriage, death, and war. Actually, a lot of music is being um, prepared in different celebrations or in any festivities that we have here in the Philippines. We do have music for those. Sentiments and emotions were also expressed in the dances. So we are not just music lovers. We are also good in terms of dancing or performing. We have the native dances like tinikling, itik-itik, maglalatik, palo-palo, and singkil. So those native dances are some of the dances that we have here in the Philippines. Actually, we do a lot of things that we can offer in terms of our culture. Writings. Our ancestors had their own system in writing. Now they used sharp pointed instruments or metals for pens and wrote on the banana leaves tree, barks and bamboo tubes. So way back then, we still don't have that ability or we have that, we don't have yet Way back then, we don't have yet um, instruments wherein we can use. But traditionally, our ancestor used some of these things in order for them to write their stories or anything that they can see that it has a beneficial. Of course, we do have the alphabet called as Alibata. It was composed of 17 letters, 3 vowels, and 14 Consonants, so that is our um, alphabet way back then, Alibata. Literature, we have the ancient literature, um, different kinds. Actually, we have two. The first one is oral literature and the other one is written literature. In terms of oral literature, it is consist of bugtong, songs, epics, such as the Darangan the Maranaos, Biagnilam Ang of the Ilocanos region, and Hudhud at Alim of the Ifugaos. So from the word itself, oral, it means it is being um, narrated orally, no, verbally, through the use of, of course, verbal languages or verbal communication. We communicate in order for us to propagate the message of these things, such as bugtong, songs, epics, and other folk tales. In terms of livelihood, we are also rich with that. We have farming, livestock raising, handicraft, 
cloth weaving, basket weaving, pottery, and fishing. Now, farming here in the Philippines is the primary source of the livelihood of the Filipinos. There are different kinds of farming. In the mountainous region, they built the rice terraces, the Banawe rice terraces. Other livelihood sources are the following. We have the livestock raising, handicraft, cloth weaving, basket, pottery, fishing. Now, people living by the seashores and river banks, of course, thrived in fishing. Now, we're done with the culture and livelihood of our Filipino ancestors and we've learned a lot of things about it. Now, let's proceed to the arrival of Islam in the Philippines. So, basically, Islam started in Mecca in modern day called Saudi Arabia. Now, during the time of the Prophet Muhammad's life, Islam officially arrived here, or I mean in the province of Sulu as a small archipelago in the south in the 13th century. Islam is the first recorded monotheistic religion in the Philippines. When we say monotheistic, it's about believing only in one God. Islam reached the Philippines in the 14th century with the arrival of Muslim traders from Persian Gulf, Southern India, and their followers from several Sultanate governments in the Malay Archipelago. In the 1380, Karim al-Makdum, the first Arabian trader, reached the Sulu Archipelago and Holo in the Philippines and established Islam in the country through trade in several regions. And in 1390, the Minangkabus prince Raha Baginda and his followers preached Islam on the islands. The Sheikh Karimal Makdum Mosque was the first mosque established in the Philippines on Simunol, Mindanao in the 14th century. Thanks for watching. See you in my next one. Please like, leave a comment, subscribe, and hit the bell button for more lessons to learn. Bye!